Hi everybody, I'm Sparrow. Um, today I have Nate Geyer and Sam Williams, founder of Mintbase and Arweave. Hi. Really happy to speak to both of these guys today because I'm a creator tokenizing my art on the blockchain through Mintbase, which is now using Arweave. So really keen to hear what these guys have to say and to tell me specifically as a creator of NFTs, why these technologies are important. So first off, um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, Sam, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Uh, so I'm Sam, uh, one of the founders of the Are We First Call, which is essentially a permanent information storage system. So it's the first storage system that is backed by um, an endowment structure, uh, which allows you to uh, essentially create economically sustainable storage of information forever, um, which has taken off a lot in the NFT space recently, um, because of course we, we have these assets that we want to make sure. So we tokenize the assets first, and then we want to make sure that those assets are around for a very long period of time uh, so that the uh, tokens themselves maintain their value. Yeah, and I, I guess this is kind of our component of this puzzle. Yep, cool. I'm uh, Nate, Nate, the uh, founders of uh, Mintbase. So this is the, the platform that basically allows folks like Sparrow to come on board uh, in a visual way to mint a token. Um, they, they can come on our, our site, basically deploy their own smart contract, uh, mint ERC721 NFT tokens uh, on that contract, and all of that metadata that gets bound to that token basically goes over to our weaving gets stored. So each one of these tokens doesn't need to just hold one image. It can hold multiple files. It could hold uh, maybe a platform enables uh, music or maybe a platform enables um, box files. Uh, all the platforms mm -hmm. get to decide what these assets do. Maybe they play music on their uh, crypto voxel land because they're the owner of this NFT. And so we basically made a massive decision about a month ago to move all of that storage from Google S3 over to Arweave. And now it's, uh, it's working. So basically, if Mintbase dies tomorrow, um, as long as Ethereum and Arweave are still alive, those tokens can live on. Very, very cool. Right. So before we deep dive into some questions, because you brought up some really interesting issues, topics there, um, can you both? tell everyone a little bit about how you got into providing the solutions that you're providing, how you got into blockchain and why you chose to do this specific project. So Nate first. Sure, yeah, uh, I, I worked pretty deep in the FinTech land with clearing firms, which basically says you have five shares of stock because we say you do and broker dealers, which is the intermediary between the customer and the it's a long drawn out story, but I really got to see how complicated the financial system is. When you throw all those away and get to interact directly with the settlement layer, Ethereum, which is the thing that you can move value from A to B very securely without a single company in between, uh, that's what really got me interested. And um, yep, shoot for it, Sam. Cool, yeah. Yeah, we started from a slightly different position, but ended up building something very general and then realizing that that general thing could be applied to lots of stuff. Um, so we, we got into this realizing that you can use blockchains to make decentralized data storage that um, is immutable, except the problem was that blockchains basically just didn't scale to fit the amount of data that we needed inside. And they also didn't have sustainable economics to back that storage. So they had kind of half of it, like the technical side of how do you coordinate computers across the world to replicate a piece of data. Um, but not the economic side that says, how do you actually then uh, incentivize the humans to store that inf or store that data for long periods of time? Um, yeah, and what we wanted to do with this originally was make an archive of news articles and other kind of records of history because we realized that that's really valuable stuff that now in the blockchain era we can make sure uh, can never be lost. But then once we solved that problem, we realized that actually this is way more applicable to really just kind of, yeah, everything from NFTs to storing web applications, storing web pages, um, PDF documents, like whatever it happens to be, uh, it's very generally applicable. And that's kind of how we got here, I guess. 
Fantastic. Okay, so let's deep dive into Arweave um, a little bit. Can you just explain? I mean, I'm familiar with IPFS. I think most people are familiar with IPFS. Can you tell us what makes Arweave different to IPFS? Yeah, sure. Uh, so IPFS is a, a content distribution network. The idea is that you, you put a piece of information into YPFS that you pin on a machine somewhere. And so you have like a centralized server that is uh, hosting the file essentially, and then it can be cached around the world and it has the same address. And then you can go IPFS colon stroke stroke hash, and you can get it from some server somewhere that is caching it or the original place that uploaded in the it, yeah, original server that uploaded in the first place. Um, that's great but it's a content distribution network. It's not really a storage layer, which is, I think, a kind of a misunderstanding in the crypto space. Arweave is a storage layer, and it's in its focus specifically on this endowment-backed permanent storage, where you pay once and you just replicate a piece of information forever. Does that right. kind of answer your question? It yeah. does. It does. It does raise um, the question about the, this endowment mechanism can can you give us sort yeah, of for sure what what's it's, that all about how does that work <laughs> yeah it's a claim that seems like it it shouldn't be reasonable up front but then you kind of get into it and it makes sense i mean so what we do is when you put a piece of information into our we, we pay for the storage of that information for 200 years which sounds like a lot it turns out storage is so cheap it's actually like approximately half a cent per megabyte and then over time, the cost of storage declines. And so you've already put across this capital, you've already put up this capital, and you essentially gain um, interest in the form of storage purchasing power on that capital you've already put aside over time. And so as long as the cost of storage declines at a greater rate than 0.5% on average every year, uh, then you essentially just continue accruing interest on this capital that you already put aside. Uh, so increasing the storage purchasing power of your endowment contribution rather than decreasing it over time. So we looked back at the history of uh, yeah, data density and data reliability over the last like 50 years. Um, and on average, the decrease is at a rate of around 30.5% per year. So our estimation of it is extremely conservative. Then on top of that, you look back like further and you see that actually you can we didn't do it inside computers before that, but we were essentially trying to store data in um, more and more dense formats. And you see that the, the exponential decay is essentially um, consistent across like thousands of years. And then the question becomes, well, okay, just because it happened in the past doesn't mean it's gonna happen in the future, right? So we looked at where we are in, in terms of the currently um, deployed technology versus uh, what the theoretical limits should be. like. What is the most data dense thing you can ever create? Um, and so where we are in terms of data density is uh, one times 10 to the power of 13 bits per cubic centimeter relative to one times 10 to the power of approximately 70, um, yeah, per cubic centimeter, bits per cubic centimeter, which is the theoretical maximum data density limit. And so if you were to continue towards that at, a, at the current average rate, of 30.5% per year, it would take you uh, 434 years, or rather it was 434 when we calculated this. That was a year ago though. So it's 433 years um, approximately. Yeah, and to reach that, that maximum point. Also, and then the final part of this- I'll oh, go ahead, the final part, hit it. <laughs> yeah, the, the final part of this argumentation is uh, to say, okay, well, fine. So it looks like it's possible for a very, very long period of time. And you know, if you put, the data in now and you get 30% uh, interest per year for at least 30, uh, 430 years, then that ends up being like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, yeah. Okay. So it's possible. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's possible. But the question is, is it, will we definitely do it? Like is the incentive there in, in human society? And we think that because everything in the economy is essentially heading towards information storage and manipulation as the jobs, as the economy itself, people's jobs now, they go to work and they take information and they turn it into more information. Data storage will continue to be at the core of that, um, yeah, change in society for an extremely long period of time to come. So that's why we think you can actually have data permanence. Okay. 
and our big selling point for MintBase was the file discovery. So like you said in your video that it could take up to seven seconds to find your files within IPFS. Um, seven you just, minutes. Seven minutes, that's right. Um, yeah. So a big difference. Uh, yeah. A website can't run like that. You can't download a page with 30 different NFTs with you know five different uh, data points for each NFT and have it take up to seven minutes for every single data piece to come together to load a page. So what you, people end up doing uh, is they basically take all that information and then put it on their own private server as a redundancy and then serve the files that way. So that's kind of a duplication and unnecessary uh, in my book. But the other idea is that you can have companies like Pinata solve this problem as well. And so then you're basically just punting uh, to another centralized system uh, to basically solve all your problems. The endowment mechanism basically decentralizes those two points. And so uh, the other big issue too is that uh, on IPFS, data can disappear. Just like how Napster worked way back in the day, um, if someone decided they don't like the Britney Spears song from way back in the day uh, and no one pings it enough, then that file just goes away. If enough computers that are hosting those files decide Britney Spears isn't cool um, and those computers go offline, then that file gets completely lost. So those two points, um, working with the decentralized endowment mechanism was our big like, aha, this, this makes sense. Yeah, I think that that was actually one of the misconceptions that that a lot of people I came in touch with had um, that they they believed that once I once something was on IPFS that it was stored there forever. Um, but you're right, it, it has to have been used for to incentivize it to be cached and and kept. Um, so that's interesting and and an important yeah. point, I think. Um, it's this difference between permanent addressing and persistence of data, which I, I don't think, frankly, the IPFS like marketing really, you know, addressed. Yep. We, we, we also like IPFS, like CDNs are great. You need them. Um, we need them on top of our network. You can access everything inside our weave if you put a special tag on it. Also inside IPFS, like it's a really valuable thing to have. It's just wasn't quite in some senses it was advertised as. Yeah, we're using it heavily with uh, our entire backend runs off of the graph and the graph basically indexes all Ethereum data to IPFS and then our interface updates based on that data. I mean, it has an immutable data structure which is extremely valuable as long as it doesn't yeah. go away. So, and what we love right. about our weave too is you have immutability and you have um, timestamps. Oh, did we lose you, Sparrow? No, nope, I'm still here. Cool. My video, my video just stopped, but All that's. Right. Nope. There we go. We're back. <laughs> cool. Um, <clears throat> right. So I was going to ask you, Nate, because I I'd asked Sam what made AR are we um, unique? What makes Mintbase different to the other NFT minting platforms? Yeah, we, so my big point is I feel like everyone should not just use one uh, NFT minting platform as their go-to. I see a lot of artists and minters not just going to one platform they use a lot. Uh, my suggestion is everyone should use all of them, play around with them, see how they all work. Uh, the most important thing is kind of we're all very small. Find a founder that has the same ideals as you and then we'll grow with you. Um, so our... Our platform isn't perfect. Nobody's platform is perfect. Uh, blockchain is not perfect. It's all, you know, it's early, early days and things break. Uh, but we, we're different. It's a big that. experiment. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to experiment with you. We want you to come to Mintbase and, you know, create a news agency, uh, add mentors as press, press people, uh, create a, um, a Dow Records label and add mentors as music artists. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a very strange world, and we want to grow with those folks that kind of want to say, okay, here's this decentralized asset that we can put on any wallet. Um, what can we do with that? And yep, that's our our focus. And it's sleek looking. It's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> if I do it say is so one myself. Of the places, yeah. It is, yeah. So, but that's so, that's actually really important because like. One of the problems we've traditionally had in the blockchain space is that everything 
looks like it was built for hackers. You know, it, it's just really, really basic. The user experience just isn't there. Um, and Mintbase is a pretty big step forward in that regard. So that's Thank you, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and certainly with utility tokens and things like that, I think that's only going to grow, you know, as and, and that needs that ease of use. Um, and like we were talking about a little bit previously, that being able to sort of plug things together to provide the functionality that, that you want, um, which is, is kind of the way I see, you know, what you're doing with Mintbase. You've plugged into the graph to get that bit because that's best in breed. You've now plugged into Arweave because that's best in breed. Um, to provide the, the exact service that, that, that's required. Um, and, and that can only expand, I think. Yeah. Um, and to that note, I feel like um, I support a lot of the other platforms. I love Super Rare. I love, um, I love them all. They're all doing it the right way, the, the hardest way that we can. Uh, it's when we start building on centralized platforms that basically punt a lot of like the hard stuff uh, back into stuff we've already done before. So um, when you're using a platform and it asks which wallet you want and it supports a whole lot of wallets, then that's, that's probably a good platform to start with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a bit off scripted, you know, there are some platforms that are trying to mask that blockchain layer, right? So they don't even want to ask for a wallet. Do, do you have an opinion on, on that? What, what, what do you guys think about sort of hiding all this tech from like artists like me? I have one thing to say. Okay, so it's like a Google Glass versus like um, the big old binoculars for like um, Oculus or something, right? Google Glass yeah. tried to like jump the jump the shark and make them sweet looking glasses, and you were gonna do all your things on it. In reality, it was too quick, too early, too soon. So uh, if someone's hiding all of that, you're gonna get a crappy experience, and it's just not gonna get the real deal. Um, but right now, I feel like we need to solve it the right way, the hard way, uh, and make people jump through the hoops to understand what they're sure. doing. And then we'll slowly get that Google Glass experience maybe uh, over time. Cool. Yeah. Sam, I mean, have... there's, okay, so if we can make the Google Glass actually decentralized, mm -hmm. then that's great. But that's going to take a, a lot more time. Uh, there are some solutions, though, right now that I think could be like, they're kind of like blockchain light, you could call it, right? So it's like, it has some of the attributes that, that a blockchain has, but you don't necessarily completely own your identity, um, which really isn't great from a, from a value add perspective, but also it does allow people to get into the ecosystem much, much faster. I think that is something that is, it's almost like try before you buy kind of thing, right? So you can like test it out with the free version. And then when you realize that it's cool, you just upgrade this slightly more complex um, version where you actually own your identity. Um, until we get the properly decentralized Google Glass, that's probably the best it's going to be for now. And like we, we do this with our weave, we say you can come to us and you can get like a, a wallet with um, used to be five our weave tokens, used to be one an our weave token, and now like um, because people try and steal these tokens so much, we've had to change it to like 0 0.25 tokens. But you can come to us and you can get a very, very small amount of R so that you can use the system in like a pre-filled wallet. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like the, the easy onboard to the network. But then when you want to use it properly, you want to make your own wallet and you want to like store it inside the web extension or something like this. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have to be sort of practical about these things while also not losing sight of why it was important in the first place. Yeah, so, so your wallet's like going to Rinkby and getting fake ass ETH to <laughs> play, oh, play around with a little bit and yeah, it's try, like, try, oh, try it out there it. before you actually make, you know, buy your, your, your real investment. Yeah, or just get your like, uh, in this sense, you know, real identity on the phone web. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, I have a question. This has been a great discussion. When really is it going to get uh, listed on uh, Coinbase? Is that coming soon? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't talk about that. <laughs> okay. So, but, one but, thing but it's now traded on like eight or nine different exchanges if you want to go there and buy or sell it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sparrow. <laughs> one, 
one minute to wrap up with each of you. Sam, do you see Arweave competing with cloud services like Google and Amazon anytime soon or in the long term? Do, do you feel that this is the model that all cloud services will move to? Um, I don't think that the focus in decentralization should necessarily be on competing with existing services. I think that the focus should probably be on allowing people to do things that they couldn't do before, like NFTs, or in our case, permanent storage of information, like literally permanent storage of information, which no centralized party could ever really sell to you because mm -hmm. you know they have centralized ownership and management and they're eventually going to change their offerings. Um, yeah, so I think what protocols do really well is they allow you to just they enable certain types of business models that weren't possible before. And that's at least where I see the interest. That's yeah. really exciting. Yeah. So Nate, NFTs in the future, what, what's your take? What, what's MintBase going to be in yeah. 10 years time? Whole theory of one blockchain winning them all. It's not going to be it. It's a, uh, there's going to be multiple different blockchains all interacting and working together, doing this, that, and the other. And yeah, that's, that's the future. So. I'm pretty, pretty excited to experiment and play around. Very cool. Thank you both for a really interesting conversation. I've learned a lot, so thanks. Thanks for moderating. Thank you. Cheers. All right.